Welcome back, everyone. I'm calling today's podcast uh, Information Highways. And last couple podcasts, we sort of had a bird's eye view and talked a lot about conceptual stuff. So there was talk about paradigms, paradigms of extraction, sustainability, uh, regenerative agriculture. I, you know, used metaphors of the golden egg, the golden goose. We talked about eating as nature's currency, sort of broad bird's eye view and, and conceptual um, uh, way to, to approach approach farming and understanding nature. And as much as I love that stuff and uh, the bird's eye is bird's eye view is 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 crucial and part of of how we maintain course it's also important i think to to be very well grounded in the science and and to, to be able to change resolution to be able to look at things at the very detailed and scientific um way to really be sure um that we are stay, <laughs> staying staying um, true to reality at that level and so um well, another way to put it would be to I'm very, very cautious of of sounding. I don't, I don't want to sound like some sort of quasi or pseudo religious terms that are very subjective, and I want it to be very grounded to show that the what I'm talking about is is very concrete, very tangible, very traceable, very scientifically measurable. And thought about a lot of how to get this across, and I and I and I think I'm going to have to weave three different um, strands into one braid, so to speak. So I want to talk about biome, and then I also want to talk about genetics and epigenetics for very briefly, and what's going on at sort of the cellular level, and then I'm going to also talk about soil. But before I jump into that, I want to quickly tell an anecdote that is very related. It's not quite at the heart of what I'm getting at, but it's very related and and um, is an example, very much so, of of what I'm getting at. And I was at a conference a few months ago, and the keynote speaker was someone who did a lot of research with the mycorrhiza, which is, um, as I understand it, is fungus. Um, that has a symbiotic relationship with roots and apparently there's all this communication going on um, between plants but especially between trees and not just um, well there was I read about it where they talk about there's a lot of information getting passed on like if they're fighting a disease or they're fighting a type of pest um, there are signals that sent off to other plants and other other trees and whatnot to this is what's going on here. This you start putting out chemicals or some um, <clears throat> some defense mechanisms and whatnot. But what ended up being really fascinating because it kind of went beyond just uh, maybe cause and effect of. Um, but it just pushed the boundaries of of how we think about uh, plants and trees. Um, but it's the well. Apparently, there's there's usually in a group of trees, say in a forest, there's a one big tree and um, considered quote unquote the, like the mother tree, and it's at the heart of a hub. And uh, that that tree's roots go down; they spread out all over the place, and they're in contact with trees all around. And uh, and it's the it's the fungus that's that's sort of the mediator between these these roots. But apparently, um, the saplings that are, are growing up around the mother tree, say the canopy above is already filled up. All the you know branches have taken. There's no they aren't getting enough sunlight. So somehow they're tracing this. I think they put some sort of dye or radioactive something they can do. Actual imagery where they can look at this, I think, in the sap and they can watch nutrients um, flow and they can actually see this um, traveling nutrients that go from the mother tree to these saplings and gives them, gives these, these little trees help and, and they get these extra nutrients so that they can grow until they finally get some of their own branches up in the canopy and can start doing some photosynthesis for themselves. And then I guess they get weaned off and then um, don't need as many nutrients. Um, 
But just the fact that we can scientifically trace um, these interactions is, is, is pretty, pretty fascinating. For our purposes, one of the latest frontiers of science has been at this real uh, microscopic level, and not just um, in genes, but uh, at the biome, and, and particularly in the gut. And we know that there's quite a lot of relationships between the gazillions of species that live within our intestines and, and the relationship to the brain, relationship to diseases, relationship to inflammation, uh, to emotion. Uh, fascinating, a fascinating rabbit hole of, and we're just learning a ton of stuff and and trying to <laughs> make sense of it all and to understand uh, nutrition within that context. Um, but there's more than just the gut. There's other, um, there's sort of biome of your skin. There's biome of your ears, your your all your different orifices, even to, uh, genital or your your vaginal, and that's become a huge. Um, realization of how important, um, uh, you know, to go through the birth canal is the first inoculation of a baby to, to let it know um, what the environment is like. Um, and it's become pretty obvious that um, babies from C-sections have a much higher risk later on of developing a number of different um, problems and diseases and so much so that there are are movements and some uh, they've been researched and so uh, active practices really of, of taking vaginal swab, swabs that if you know you're going to have a c-section they will they will you know before you're taking all your antibiotics and all your pain medicine and everything um, get a vaginal swab after the child is delivered um, they're swabbing eyes and ears, mouth, you know, all over, just because it's so crucial. Uh, there's this information that's that's being passed on to the baby about what the environment is, and and it, uh, apparently the first three years of life or so, it's very important for the baby to not only know what the environment is, but to know precisely like what is dangerous and needs to be, you know, have an immune response against and what is benign and, and, and even what is beneficial. And uh, the more information that the baby has already passed down, in a sense, vertically from the, from the mother and from the environment around it, it can make uh, better uh, sense of what's going on, and, and obviously then the systems work better within the immune response. And if this leads directly into autoimmune issues, and if we have uh, C-sections, which of course in our typical medical um, healthcare environment, they're way way overdone, and. Um, you know, if, you know, there's, there's stats out there and I don't know exactly what they are, but you know, if, if five to 10% of C-sections are necessary, you compare that to the, the average of, you know, 35, 40% of, of what goes on, um, in, in the U.S. And this is ridiculous, you know, and then you bring that baby home and it's, it's already at, at a disadvantage for, for not knowing, um, what it needs to, you know, what the environment is around it and, and how it should be responding. To get a sense of contrast, I listened to an interview of a guy named Jeff Leach and he was doing research in Tanzania with the Hadza, which is a, uh, a group, a tribe that's still fairly traditional and as close as we can get to um, to get hunter and gatherer culture that hasn't been too contaminated. And what he was doing was collecting just a buttload of data, and he was um, gathering, doing a lot of well, mostly their their manure, but did not just that. He was analyzing the biome. Of, of trees, of leaves, of animals, of, of water, um, on top of all their, their fecal matter. And he, he tells a story of, of how he first really, you know, got his eyes open to what was going on. And he had gone with a group of hunters and they had, um, 
hunted down an antelope and, uh, you know, shot it, killed it. And then they were dressing it and, and they're just out in the field and they're just, their hands are full of blood and they're, you know, they've gutted this animal and they sort of take out these choice bits and they're like eating some of the intestines and the stomach lining right there. And it's just, he just suddenly realized that he just, the exchange of, of bacteria and the exchange of biome and just the, the, I mean, this wasn't inoculation anymore. This was just like bathing in, a, <laughs> just completely doused in bacteria. So, you know, and, and the, the exchange, there was none of this like saran wrapped, you know, been through bleach chlorinated food that, you know, has to been utterly sterilized by the time it got to you, whether it's, or homogenized, or, you know, pasteurized, whatever. These guys were just utterly immersed in their environment. And uh, so he just, he just, suddenly it was just in his face, you know, and then they, of just how they, they may wash their hands in the creek, but then, you know, they wash, they're not using antibacterial soap or anything, you know, and then they scoop up some water and they're drinking and there has been animals, you know, that have drunk out of there and others that have, you know, pooped in there and whatever you know just an entire they are just utterly immersed in in the ecosystem there you know maybe they go home and they're greeting everybody and you know then everybody else eats of this uh you know of the food and there's just this utter exchange of of uh, of information and, and of these bacteria going back and forth if you know if the if the mycorrhizoa, the, the, the fungus the between the roots of the trees was the intermediary of communication between roots and trees, here it, it's bacteria. And they were kind of speculating in this interview, I think it was with Chris Ryan, and they were speculating about, you know, oh, well, well, they were talking about how when we take an antibiotic, you know, we can really deplete our just the the numbers of not it's, we're not just hitting the bad bacteria but we can kill a lot of really good bacteria in our gut biome you know and and then talking about taking probiotics and getting re-inoculated and and they were just sort of speculating you know if if these guys were to happen to take a antibiotic you know the the re-inoculation would just be immediate as soon as they're back in their environment I mean, there's so few physical barriers between them. So from the, from their bare feet, you know, to their, uh, where they sleep, they may sleep on a mat on top of the dirt. It's just, and that was in contrast to, um, you know, we take a probiotic and they were sort of laughing. Um, you know, you might have 16 to 25, you know, different, you know, advertised that this, probiotic has and who knows what the shelf life was but this this was this like tiny feeble effect or feeble attempt in front of the just vast enormity of the diversity of you know of a biome in the gut and he uh, i think jeff made <clears throat> the analogy of you know you're in the amazon rainforest and you plant a few different daisies at the base of a tree hoping that this was going to inoculate and really have a really big effect on the ecosystem there and in reality, we very limited. We have very limited knowledge of of all. We're just forging into this, you know, this area, this new frontier, and we have so much to learn. But we can bring principles of of ecology. We know that environments are healthier the more diverse, and the and, you know the greater amount of of systems interlocking with the within each other. And one of the things that comes across in the interview with uh, Mr. Leach was just that uh, the the pure just a quantity of different species of bacteria that these guys had in their biome which like double ours you know a, from a gazillion to twice gazillion you know and it was if just um for as little as we know we can still have an idea that um we are far from really being healthy, especially when we live, we live our lives in fear. We've grown up in a paradigm where we're always scared of what's in the soil. We're scared of bacteria here. We're scared of what's in food and, and in some case, rightly so. 
But our approach to these problems is always in the negative. It's always a mitigation. It's always a um, let's let's not change our paradigms of how we grow things because there's causing uh, you know it's causing our food to be full of well if it's milk then it's full of pus and if it's other things it's full of chemicals or it may have diseases in it and instead of trying to change how we raise animals or making it a better we we begin to have an approach that is all about minimal um, or, or a maximum a maximum amount of of residue allowed in your food. So, you know, you may have this many parts per million of this chemical in it and it's still safe. And so it's this negative approach of like, how much bad can you have and still be okay? And it just seems like that's um, just starts reverberated into all our life where we're not really trying to live well. We're not trying to have a healthy system. We're just trying to avoid the the dangers and, and avoid, you know, avoid the the worst of the chemicals. And we're trying to avoid having too much of bad in our lives. And it just seems that the whole the whole paradigm is 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 backwards. I did say that I wanted to keep this concrete and uh, based in in the nitty gritty details. So um, I want to move on to the second strand, and and that's um, genetics and epigenetics. And uh, I, again, another area of science that's really exploding. Um, but as far as I'm understanding, uh, our we used to think of of the, our DNA as you know our genetics we get from our parents, and um, that that's really set. And you know we may have some environmental influences but you know really 50 percent or more is just set in stone and that's that's what we got to deal with but it turns out that the the genes that we inherit from our parents the the, the stuff that codes is actually a very very small percentage of 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 all the dna that's in the nucleus in the cells and that the 90 some percent of the rest is like non coding DNA. Um, at one point, they used to call it junk DNA because they just didn't know what it was doing. But now we have an idea that um, this is all very vital um, uh, instruments of, of interacting with its environment. And so the, the double helix does, is, well, I guess scientists call it breathing, where um, you have these cells and they have the nucleus in there with all the DNA. Nutrients come in and you have the proper vitamins or minerals or whatnot. And as that enters into the cell, the DNA responds. So they'll unwind and breathe and then it exposes the strands of, of genetic material that can bind appropriately um, with, with the nutrients that are available. And then this sets off a uh, whole epigenetic uh, pathway. And this is all in response to what's right there available, what that cell is immersed in. This was another of those areas that we learned uh, and noticed quite uh, this phenomena happening from a very negative impact. Um, and this was... Uh, I think there was a Dutch famine after World War II where the Germans enforced a, a, a very, very, um, basically a nutritional deficiency. And and any of the babies, oh, you know, the mothers who were pregnant at that time and they didn't have enough calories, um, it was very clear that the babies born at that time uh, had all sorts of health problems. And there were other studies done and research done on populations that had um, times of scarcity and times of, of, of plenty and how this, this sort of genetic, uh, epigenetic um, transmission of information was multi-generational and not just down to, to one generation. It was affecting even grandkids and so on. And so these things are incredibly crucial if we want to consider health. So it, and it, and it demonstrates how just utterly naive and clumsy really to, 
to think of nutrition in terms of three macronutrients just to get protein and and uh, fat and and carbohydrate ratios right because it's so much more complex and there's so much more diversity involved and so many um vitamins and and trace minerals and you know it's going to be you know 10 times more complicated as we learn more and more and and it just seems like I don't want to wait for science to figure out all the stuff, even if it ever could, because I want to be able to try to provide as rich and as beneficial in an environment that I can for my DNA by eating as much nutritionally dense and healthy food that I can get that into my blood system so that all, you know, I'm firing on all cylinders. So let's move on to the third strand, and, and that's of soil. And I would have to say that I first really made the very concrete um, connection between soil and nutrition when I was watching a um, uh, it was a Savory Institute um, conference of putting grasslands to work in. 2014 and there was this physician and nutritionist named Daphne Miller and um, she just it all kind of clicked in my head when she was uh, giving her presentation and she just made a really she did a really good job of showing how they were taking the analysis of the RNA of soil bacteria and they were showing that it was it was reflecting itself in the plants that were grown, you know, and there was a big difference between um, the conventional grown versus organic how, and in terms of just diversity of, of the bacteria that was being transferred from the soil to the food. And then naturally as a nutritionist, you know, she was showing how, how that food then transfers that diversity into us, um, into our, our, our biome, into our whole, you know, immune system and whatnot. And it was very interesting that she made these parallels of how um, the conventional agriculture had, you know, to approach to soil was to, you know, you analyze and you and you test and then you see what you're missing and then you, you know, you buy your you buy your supplements and then you replace your deficiencies in your soil and everything. And much like I had made, I told a little anecdote about uh, this NRCS dude that had come to our our place in the winter, and you know that was his advice. And but she had made this connection that she was in her doctor's office doing the very same thing. And I remember she has you know a picture of like all these vitamins, and she's trying to replace all these vitamins, and she just felt like she was really missing the boat. She was just. Because, you know, you just, you just don't seem to get anywhere. And at the same time, it's just so expensive and you're always just trying to add all these things. And so she just really tried to delve deep and she met with a lot of researchers and did a lot of research. I, I never read it, but I believe her book is called Pharmacology, uh, as an F-A-R-M. And just in each case, it all went back to the soil. And that's what's fascinating is that um, the the biodiversity in the soil would just that would be uh, transmitted physically transmitted into the plants and then either the from the plants it gets physically transmitted into us or into a you know if you're going to go through the loop and you're going to go through that system of an animal eating it it goes into that animal and then that animal into us so this gives a whole nother deeper layer of uh, and depth to what it would mean to to eat locally and why because suddenly you if you eat locally your biome and your gut is really going to start reflecting the biome in the soil and then that much more reason to be taking care of soil and this is very much um, part of what drives me nuts with um, organic meat or organic eggs because basically all that means is that they're feeding these animals organic grain and in most cases well over 90 percent of these cases these animals are inside a building so it, it's not just that they aren't out you know they're not outside in the sunlight they're not out chasing bugs 
It's that we've broken again those feedback loops. We've broken the interconnectedness of, of, of these things. And so, again, they're participating in a system where they're getting grain and they're getting um, from a monocropped, you know, industrial um, farm. And you basically, that soil, which in almost all cases has completely been depleted of nutrition, that's being translated into what they're eating. And then that goes into the egg. And it, it's proven over and over by many, many studies that you can have an organic egg and it can be fed, you know, a, a omega-3 diet and a DHA and all, all this different stuff that they're trying to supplement with. But it doesn't remotely compare that if they're in this continuous feedback loop with soil, which is in a continuous feedback um, loop with the pasture, that these nutrients are just available to them all the time. And so they're just thriving and their epigenetics are are being turned on. And so then that gets translated into the egg. And then when we eat that egg... Um, versus, you know, an organic egg inside of a building, then um, we, we've suddenly, we've participated in this very local system and that it's all attuned. It's all attuned to, to, to our region. It's attuned to our climate. It's, it's tuned to the season and it's tuned to, you know, what is helping the, the bird thrive. And this goes the same for meat. It goes the same for milk. Um, there is just the more feedback loops that we can just be part of and, and, and be intertwining and, and communicating. Again, it's this informational transmission. And in this case, we have nutrients um, that are, are, are being transmitted from soil to animal and then back into the soil. And this is all part of the, what you the health of the pasture and it's the health of the pasture is reflected in the health of the meat so this speaks once again to the point of how it's it, we we lose something when we're only focused on mitigating the negative so we usually think of we want organic because we don't want uh, you know the the pesticide and the herbicide and the fungicide we don't want these toxic things to be in our system and yes, that's true. We don't, you know, we don't want toxic. But that's not the real crime. The real crime that's actually going on is that when you spray pesticides, there's an, you know, in taking care of all these insects, these insects are vital to the ecosystem. They are more of these feedback loops that they're vital to not just, um, not just for pollinating, but you know, it, it goes all the way up to the food chain and maybe in, and bacteria within their stomachs as they're eating plants and whatnot. And then you've got your uh, herbicides. So of course you're trying to eliminate everything but the one monocrop that you're growing. So you're you know you you're taking trying to take every feedback loop out of there except the one. And then you've got your herbicides and your, uh, well, your fungicides. So you're, now you're trying to get rid of all these, you know, uh, fungus and whatnot. So, and, and that's destroying the, the fungus and the bacteria that's in the roots. That's helping that, helping the roots to actually absorb nutrients from the soil. So in each case, these things are breaking cycles and they're destroying the diversity, the biodiversity and the soil becomes more and more sterile and depleted of nutrients or it's depleted of what it needs in order for to communicate these nutrients in order for the the information of nutrients to be transmitted so it's a little bit like destroying your infrastructure of highways um, and all in the name of of trying to get oh we're getting hundreds of bushels of corn but in the process okay great you're destroying everything else and even that corn itself is really nutritionally deficient so we are in many ways a population that's way overfed calorie wise but nutritionally deficient we're malnourished and this is 
it on so many levels, but really when it gets down to it, it gets down to the soil. And we need to have as many open communications and as much biodiversity in order for these nutrients to work themselves up the food chain and into us for our very own health. I want to go back to the cow and when I was talking in the earlier podcast about putting in her in her niche and as she's the driving engine on the pasture taking that solar energy and and ameliorating the pasture as she goes. So suddenly uh, now that we fleshed it out a little bit really when we think of biome, genetics, and soil and putting that all together we need to think about what the feedback loop so she's she's out on the pasture and a uh, good healthy soil is making a good healthy pasture she eats that grass and whatnot and there's all this bacteria as well as nutrients inside that grass and pasture it goes into her stomach and that communicates with the biome inside her gut and then that begins to uh, change accordingly and what's there and if you know that's that much more important that she's she's local and that she's um, used to what's here um, a little quick example of, of we've got tons of fescue here and uh, there's a lot of animals that they have problems with fescue and then they have problems with the coats and they have um, fertility problems and whatnot but the ones that I've here and been have have grown accustomed to it and have you know adjusted themselves they've got their systems working fine and they do just fine on fescue and then that fescue grass is great for going through the winter and stockpiling it retains a ton of its nutrition deep into the winter and you can stockpile that and be feeding that instead of even having to do hay and then it's, it saves a lot of money and it's very very healthy for the animal so there's this communication and now her biome knows how to change and react and and what she needs and then of course, that feedback loop it continues as she excretes and she drops her manure. And there's, I mean, manure is mostly bacteria. So that's, again, information going back into the soil. And the soil now, the plants that, that do well with that, those kind of bacteria inside that manure, they respond and they grow. And then that goes into all while sequestering carbon, all while the methane actually going into the soil. And then the, you know, the soil and the plants are reacting and they've got this feedback loop so they've got all this information that's come from the cow manure and then all you got plenty of bugs involved in this you've got dung beetles and you got worms and you've got you know all sorts of things taking care of these patties you, you got birds coming in and eating it and you know all these feedback loops are communicating with each other and 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 the pasture is just dying for this i mean they have examples of of doing rotational grazing in pastures where they've kind of been abused for a long time and suddenly they have species from like uh, they haven't recorded from like a hundred years ago just start popping up you know and suddenly the conditions are right and then when the conditions are right those are the plants that are going to grow and when those are the plants that grow then the bacteria is just adjusting inside the cow and so it just it's this beautiful feedback loop and so if we can tap into that and be either getting the milk from this grass-fed cow or eating the meat suddenly we've tapped into this very synergistic very vital and healthy and uh, system and then we become a part of it and hopefully you know our biome is responding and is 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 adjusting accordingly so that we have this information coming directly into us and so uh, to to wrap up the sort of three strands that I was talking about the biomes are essential there's biomes of every you know those are the the mediators you know of this information getting passed on and then this information of nutrients, I mean, soaks into our <laughs> into our cells and, you know, into our bloodstream. It goes into our cells and then it's affecting us on very deep levels epigenetically so deeply that this goes down, can go down to our children and our children and our children's children. And this can go down in a negative way 
or we can pass on a, a positive and thriving um, and then and and always making that connection to the soil and because that's where it all starts and so that that soil is whatever's in that soil is going to re get reflected up the food chain and, and that's the that's the kind of system that we want to participate in and that's the kind of system that that we're going to thrive on.